Howdy folks, Jim coming at you again. Um, we were talking about Jackie Pullinger and I found another video. I've got the book and of course I'm, I'm, I am promoting the book. I don't get nothing from the book. Malcolm Smith told me to go read this book called Chasing the Dragon, the story of Jackie Pullinger in Hong Kong. And so I found this little video, it's 30 minutes. I hope you'll take the time to watch it. I hope more so you'll take the time to get the book and read the book. Um, again, I just say, wow, it is absolutely amazing. Sometimes you read a book, you read it again. I mean, if you wanna know what real ministry is like, I mean, I love to study the scriptures. And Malcolm warned me one time, we can get too intellectual with scripture. And I think sometimes we, I get too intellectual with scripture and forget what real ministry is. Uh, I know we're, we're forgiven, but Father, forgive me and help me keep my feet on the ground and minister your love and your life as Jackie is. And may the Lord richly bless her to continue this ministry. But I hope you'll take the time again with this video and listen to this amazing story. You want to you want to you want to hear about the book of Acts in modern day? Listen to this woman's story of ministry in Hong Kong to the drug addiction, uh, sex slavery, demonic cults, you will absolutely be astonished. So please enjoy the video. And may the Lord richly bless you all. with about eight pounds, but I thought I was very rich. And two things I think I knew. One was that God had promised to look after me. And the other was that you should work wherever you can. So I looked around Hong Kong to see what there was to be done. And I was really overwhelmed. And I think lots of people are, when they come to a place like Hong Kong or India, or nowadays, London or, or California if their eyes are open, that is, because once you begin to see needs, they are not ending. And so I looked at all these needs and said, well, God, where do I start? Because I could spend a whole life in one street, and uh, at the end of my life, I could just about have begun to love one street. But, um, you know, you walk out of one and into another. So I knew it was important, maybe not to understand the whole thing, but to do my bit. And that turned out to be Wall City. Since 1898, Kowloon Wall City has been a political embarrassment beyond the reach of any legal system. For the last 30 years, it has inspired terror in the population of Hong Kong. The Chinese call it Haknam, which means darkness. Its six and a half acres have been an incubator for a unique concentration of opium and heroin dens, illegal gambling, extortion, prostitution, and violence, under the control of five triad societies, the King Yi, the Sun Yi On, the Dao Choi, the Walshing Wall, and the 14K. When the British took possession of Hong Kong Island in 1843, it was a Chinese custom station, and a granite wall 
with six forts was built round the area to protect the inhabitants from the foreign devils and the opium traffic now being conducted by the British from Hong Kong Island. It became a garrison city and by the treaty leasing the new territories to Britain in 1898, it was to remain part of China. But six years later, smitten by plague, it was deserted except for a few pig farmers. In 1946, refugees from the Chinese Civil War started to build on the site. And in the same year, the British colonial government made brothels illegal. So pimps, prostitutes and drugs dealers found sanctuary amongst the immigrants. Officially, the police could only watch, as during the 1960s, refugees from the Chinese Cultural Revolution poured onto the site and the walled city grew until it reached the flight path of aircraft coming into land at Hong Kong's International Airport, only 400 yards away. With the surrounding squatter area, the population grew to an estimated 50 or 60,000 people, served only by four standpipes, pirated electricity through open wiring, open sewers where enormous rats cockroaches flourished amongst children, emaciated cats, dogs, pigs and chicken. Brothels with blind, mental and child prostitutes. Illegal dentists and doctors with thriving abortion practices. 14K controlled all the prostitutes and the opium dens, which there were 32 of. Between them, they paid an enormous amount of protection money, something like 100,000 Hong Kong dollars a day, to the police, who weren't supposed to be here, but nevertheless were quite involved in the business. Protection for all shopkeepers, uh, gambling dens, blue film theatres. Right at the beginning, it was the little children that took me around the streets because I taught in a school. And they used to take me a different way, and I used to make them lead me out a different way each time. And nobody minded because I was with the children. And that's how I got to know the drug dens. And gradually to find out that uh, Gogo and the 14K were, in fact, controlling the whole place. Through uh, lots of little lanes, hardly connected, you'd find your way to the actual door or one of the old gates of the walled city. Um, and then you'd go into real blackness because that's where all the houses are built uh, on top of one another and no light ever got down. The addicts and the uh, people who guarded the dens didn't take that much notice of me um, because they're very keen on children getting an education. Then I began to find out what the people in the streets were doing. And there were old women, and some of them very young, just would sit on orange boxes in doorways like this, with needle marks on the back of their hands, and I learned that that's where women inject. Um, and I learned that the older ones were looking after the younger ones, who sometimes 12 or 13 were just sold. She looked after uh, all the young prostitutes. In fact, that's how she made her living. She was the queen of the street. And they, some of them worked until they were 67 or so. What she did was to steal one from the street who was mentally deficient. And um, because nobody would miss her, they took her into their brothel. And she's still used up until this day. And nobody knows she's missed because uh, Nobody would bother to look for her. Most of the young street kids joined the tribes very, very young. Some of them began running messages when they were seven or eight and used to carry choppers or knives for gang fights. Or well, later they carried drugs because uh, police were less likely to stop little boys. Later on after that, lots of the young people thought, well, I wonder what all this is about the white powder I'm carrying for my dialo. Um, maybe I'll try some. about a hundred people chasing the dragon and down the streets 
the people actually were sitting, openly smoking, some of them not very conscious, some of them quite angry. I got my, my foot burnt. I thought as Jesus had helped me, I'd try Jesus on them. Trouble is, I couldn't speak any Chinese. So uh, I learned a few words. I learned how to say Jesus loves you, but it didn't work. Um, I went up to them and uh, I tried Yeso Oine in, in my best Cantonese. And they just said, which means, what does that have to do with me? Why don't you go find someone else? So I, I learned that it was important not to say the words which nobody could understand. I mean, why would anybody understand Jesus loves you? I mean, if they don't know who Jesus is, nobody's ever loved you. So I had to be Jesus to them rather than say the words. And uh, that, of course, would mean things like somebody had no, no money, maybe giving them money or no food, you'd give them yours or no house. They could sleep in yours. Or if they had no job, would mean finding them a job or visiting them in prison or walking an extra mile and, and giving your own clothes, in fact, sharing your life because um, that's what Jesus did. And over the years, um, something went in. In fact, it was, I always remember walking out late one night, it was, it was about two in the morning and passing by a, a noodle stall in the streets and hearing one um, man, he'd obviously just come out of prison because he'd got very short hair, uh, saying to his friend, Pun Siu Zhe, Bat Sam Sam Yat Tat Gao. Miss Pun, 833179. Next time you get arrested, um, call her number. Not if you get arrested, but next time you get arrested, because they were always getting arrested. And about half the time for things they hadn't done. Just addicts of fair game. And uh, so he said, it doesn't matter what time of day or night you call, she'll come. And, and whether you've done it or not doesn't matter. But one thing you must remember, you must tell the truth, because she's a Christian. And I, I remember dancing out of the city that night because it was, I knew something had gone in. That is that whatever time of day or night, or whether you've done it or not, he'll come because Jesus' name is truth. Beginning to see the, the rows and the roads and the huts full of men who were taking heroin and to, to visit the opium dens. And uh, I was distressed that we didn't have an answer. Um, it didn't seem to be good enough to hand them a piece of paper and say, you know, register at such and such a, a clinic. Um, I was sure that if Jesus were here, he'd heal them. And I began to look at the Bible and I saw that he healed everybody who came to him, everybody. And uh, I thought it'd be wonderful to go down the lanes, you know, lay your hands on blind people and see them seeing. I mean, that, that would be a whole lot more fun and real than saying, come to our Sunday service, you know, because they, they, they don't come to your Sunday service. They haven't got shoes and they can't read, you know. So it's, you know, mguanko they see, it's not relevant. And I saw that um, Jesus and his disciples had this power and even when Jesus went, the disciples went on healing people and Jesus said we were supposed to. Now I remembered that when I left England, I knew of a person whom I greatly respected who's um, in the Anglican church who was reputed to speak in tongues. Um, and he had a very remarkable uh, and, and real ministry. So uh, I, I, I thought somehow this might be connected and I read more books. And uh, the, the sound of the gift of tongues was great because apparently suddenly you had words which you, you hadn't learnt, which enabled you to express all that was in your heart without being confined by the limits of your own expression. If God has anything from his spirit that will help me to be real to people, I don't want to just preach, then I'd like that. So I said, Jesus, that's what I'd like, and I'll decide what to call it later. I met this couple on the edge of the walled city one night, and as soon as I saw them, I just knew they'd got whatever it was. So I went up to this couple's house, and they came to pray for me, and they put their hands on my head, you know. But then they told me to speak in tongues, and I was quite annoyed about that, because I wasn't going to perform, you know. I thought, 
if God's going to do it, he's going to do it. So I, I kept my mouth firmly shut and of course nothing happened except I got hot. Um, and it was very humid and I stuck to the seat and I was terribly embarrassed because they got this plate of oranges and which was to celebrate and this plate of flannels for me to cry into. And, um, and all I could think about during that awful time was, oh God, they're, they're not gonna need either plate. And uh, finally, I, I was so embarrassed that I opened my mouth to say, help God in English. And when I opened my mouth, of course, he was able to give me a new language, which came up quite fluently. From then on, she prayed in tongues every day for 15 minutes by the clock. And I would say before I began, Lord, there are all these people dying. You want them to have life, and I want them to have life. Please help me now to pray for them with your understanding, because when you pray in tongues, you pray according to the Spirit of God, and he knows how to pray for those people better. And the extraordinary thing was that a few weeks after beginning to do this, I found I'd tell people about Jesus and they'd believe. And um, at first I thought my language was, had, had improved and my Chinese had suddenly got good. And then I realized I was saying exactly the same things I'd said before. But this time I was saying them to the right people. I was saying them to people who were all ready to hear, who immediately understood. Every night, uh, dozens of um, youngsters used to come in. When I say youngsters, that was anything from 14 up to about 40s, but, but mostly uh, people in their late teens. And a growing number, I found out, um, were addicts. And of course, they were all triads. I have a game of people. It's under to me. They in the youth cup fighting. They'd smashed in the windows, broken up the chairs, and taken sewage out of the gutters and painted the walls with sewage. And I didn't know why this had happened. She cried all the next day, struggling with the mess and sense of betrayal. Then she says she remembers that in the Bible, it says you should praise God under all circumstances, so with great difficulty, she tried. The next night, I stood at the doorway, frightened. I mean, I wasn't frightened of being beaten up, but I, I was frightened of being rejected because I'd spent all this time with these young people. And I knew that it was my friends who'd beaten up the place. So I heard about it from our elder brother, Coco. I won't link to them. If you don't believe Jesus, okay, just matter. You're coming out, you're fighting. Just this, don't make Jackie sad. So the stranger appeared, um, and he sort of lolled against the door. And I said, who are you? And he said, uh, Gogo sent me. And I said, um, well, why? Because up until that time, I'd never met Gogo. And uh, I just knew he was the head of the 14K. And he said, Gogo says, uh, if anybody touches you or touches this place, we're going to do them. And Jackie heard about that. Why you come to Youth Cup uh, to warning your people? This is not their fault. They will be done uh, because Jesus loved them. I don't mind. I refuse his offer because Jesus is looking after us down here. And he said, Chisi, because um, his rank in the triad society was a 426, which meant that he controlled the fights. He was the fight fixer. And he knew it wasn't Jesus controlling the streets. Anyway, that was the beginning of my meeting with him. And every night, he used to stand at the door, never came in, but he was under orders to watch me. So Jackie asked me, do you want to believe Jesus? I spoke to her. I'm a drug addict. How can I belong to Jesus? When I believe Jesus, I on drug. So I tell I tell you I tell you I belong to Jesus. I'm nine. So, so she said, if you believe Jesus, Jesus will give you the power. The power can give you the healing. You can get off the trunk. So I think when it, when it, 
I'm medical. So I, I will want to try. I say, if Jesus can heal me, no medicine. They have power. So why not? I spoke to her. I tried many times myself. I get off drug. After one week, after one month, after one year, I will take a drug again. So she said, this Jesus, different. She give you a long life, change your life, new one. So, OK, I will try, I said. He went straight into to that little room there, and uh, he started singing his head off. It, it was an awful noise, because he can't sing. But he'd heard songs through the door. And then he began to pray, and he'd never heard anyone pray before. Um, and then he began to pray in tongues, which I hadn't told him about. And what happened was that this lasted for about half an hour, and during that half an hour, he actually came off opium. Thank you, Jesus. Changed my life and gave me a half job. I still uh, keep to Jesus this night. Thank you. This even affected the boss of the Wall City, whose name was Gokko, which means big brother of big brothers. And he'd send someone else down to watch me. And then he uh, became a Christian too, so he sent someone else down. This went on for some time. trying to meet Gogo, but he wouldn't accept my invitations to tea until one day I, I waited for him outside an opium den. I waited for hours, because, I mean, he could be fed shots all, all day long. He didn't have to pay. Finally, he staggered out, and we went off and had Horlicks together. And um, he started being very nice to me, and I said, um, well, you know, I wish you wouldn't be so nice to me because you and I are enemies. I said, I'm, I'm actually dedicated to uh, taking your brothers um, away from you so they can start a new life in Jesus. And he said, um, well, we've watched you and uh, we've, we've, we've watched many people here um, in Hong Kong. And he said, we're not very impressed with whether they offer us noodles or hymn singing. What we really want to know is if, if there's anything to do with us. And he said, when you'd been here four years, we thought maybe you meant what you said. And he said, um, I've tried with my way to get people off drugs. He meant with force. And he said, I can't. And he said, I see you use the heart. So um, he said, I tell you what, I'll give you um, my brothers. And. Uh, you can have them for Jesus. And I said, no, thanks. Because I, I knew he wanted Jesus just to get them off drugs. Um, and then he wanted them back, because they made very bad fighters when they're on drugs. So I said, you can't have them back if they come to Jesus, um, because they can't follow two masters. And he said, I tell you what, um, I'll give you all the rotten ones. And I said, well, that's good, because Jesus came for the rotten ones. And uh, so from, from that day onwards, he freed any of his brothers um, from the triads who wanted to become Christians. But he said, they better do it good. I don't want them back afterwards. And uh, about, oh, 13 or 14 years after that happened, um, he himself 
became a Christian. Increasingly, as, as uh, new addicts came in, when they were being prayed with to come to know Jesus and to, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, I didn't actually um, touch them or go near them. I left the other brothers to do that. Four days later, he came, and we've got a room full of people who are on heroin. I mean, they're on heroin average of 15 years. You see, he never read the Bible, and a lot of our people can't and never will be able to. We presume that they've come because they're hungry. We presume they've come because they know they're sick and they need help. And we also presume that God wants to meet that need. I had no faith in the beginning. I thought I was going to die. How can I get off drugs without any medication whatsoever? The worst thing is the pain inside because it's not it's not something you can just sort of punch and, 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 and dampen the, the pain or, or just knock it out. It's inside, it's inside the bone, it's inside the marrow, like, you know, and it's really tearing, tearing away at you, telling you that you've got to go out, you've got to go and get it, you've got to go and get it. It shoots all the way up to your brain. If you prayed in tongues in private, you could expect that God would use you in gifts such as praying for the sick, words of knowledge, that is when he gives you particular information about somebody that you wouldn't normally know and how to pray for the solution to their problem. You have to give yourself up. You have to give away your past. You have to really give it to Jesus and be really open because he does help us. He really, he really does help us, you know. I mean, he, he, he showed me in, what he could do in three days, what people couldn't do in years, you know. Not medical history, not, not, not anything. They couldn't do this and, you know, I mean. And I've been on drugs for so long that it's, I thought it was really impossible. We um, specifically implemented praying with somebody over a period of three or four or five days, um, praying in tongues and asking for gifts of knowledge and prophecy and so on, says that we could then, um, nearly everyone that came could be assured of coming off drugs um, with no pain, with no medication. A life in heroin was really horrible. And then I met uh, Jackie down in India and spread for me and yeah I know that there's there's something who could change me but I could not find out what was that thing that could change me and she explained to me that it's the Holy Spirit that could help me so I invite the Holy Spirit to come into me and after that it's I, 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 I can't even believe myself it's so easy that I get out of it and it just helped me, and whenever I got the temptation back to get into heroin again, I just invite the Holy Spirit through speaking in tongues, and the Holy Spirit just give me the strength to fight that temptation and that evil thing. <laughs> the definition of a Christian for Jackie and the brothers is very clear. One who, who knows um, and has been touched by the love of, of God shown through Jesus, understanding um, that he gave up his life, um, and having been touched, is impelled to show that love in practical and in, and in spiritual and miraculous ways to other others. And I'd say if people don't show it in a practical way to, to the poor and those around, They've never been touched by the love. And I, I would say those that rule out the, uh, the idea of miraculous intervention may never have understood that a dead Christ was raised to life miraculously. Our own fellowship is extraordinary. We have street sleepers sitting beside Supreme Court judges or bank presidents 
And sometimes those men have become believers because of what they've seen God do in the poor. And it says in the Psalms that if you have clean hands, you can lift them up to the Lord. And so we tell the addicts, we've been forgiven by Jesus. And you have too. And you can lift your arms. And they, they lift up their arms with all these track marks all the way down. But the Lord's made them clean. And that's what we have to proclaim to the whole world. Yeah.